Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Holmes Hummel, and I'm so pleased to be here. I've been invited to the National Academies of Sciences on multiple occasions to work with roundtables, workshops, and other symposia. It's always an honor, certainly a privilege. I want to thank the organizers and the conveners, and uh, also people on the panel who sharpen my own sense of experience and expertise with their years of insight. I'm sorry that I wasn't with you in th this morning to hear remarks by my friend and colleague, Rafael Bostic, who inspired me as an appointee in the Obama administration when I served as the senior policy advisor in the Department of Energy's Office of Policy and International Affairs. My contribution to you today is an extension of that work when we were both trying to harness the alignment between public interest and investment uh, that would address national concerns and considerations related to public health and national security as they converge around topics like climate change uh, and local resilience. Let me use these visual aids to step quickly through a body of knowledge that you may be familiar with, some of you uh, in some sections greater than others, but my challenge in this time that we've been given is to draw these things together in a way that you'll be able to see with a sharpened focus the confluence of factors that affect equity and access in the clean energy revolution. First of all, the clean energy revolution is well underway. It is actually unstoppable. The problem is that it is not happening nearly fast enough. We need to understand some of our past to understand our present and what we face in the future. So let me outline my remarks with these four sections, looking back first, then see seeing some of the implications for our future, then talking about how we can recover the social costs of the public health hazards that we incur uh, as we try to redeploy uh, some of those resources through public spending. And I want to show you where the limits of those strategies related specifically to carbon pricing and public investments are found and ways we can build bridges across that clean energy divide to expand opportunity for all. This is a picture from space that I think all of you will recognize, but what's breathtaking to me is what that picture looked like just merely 100 years ago. You are scholars of human health. Think of what our planet looked like from this vantage point just a century ago. And what you know from this image is the compounding influence of modern energy development and human development during the same period. In fact, the coincidence of these occurrences is so strong that we use one as an indicator of the other. These are metrics of energy development that are constantly quoted as indicators for human development, for example, in the Human Development Report issued annually by some of the multilateral development banks. The trend that you see here that links energy demand with economic development is so robust so profoundly persistent that for many years, some policymakers thought it was irreversible and perhaps non-negotiable. Now we face an existential threat related to the change in the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans that's causing us to rethink the basis for this link and the imperative to protect human health by addressing its fundamental um, uh, relationship to the need for human development. Here you have the world scientists collaborating in an unprecedented way, one that of course won the Nobel Prize, by using their knowledge and the data from public health among other fields to warn us that with the boom in uh, human development, we have found ourselves with a dependency in the global economy that extends uh, deeply into the energy sector, uh, our dependence on fossil fuel. 80, more than 80% of the energy in the global economy is fossil fueled, and as I mentioned, that dependence is now creating hazards to health that stress life support systems around the world in an existential way. When I was serving as the senior policy advisor at the Department of Energy, I took a briefing that was offered to every senior energy policy advisor in every Department of Energy in every industrialized country on Earth. And we all saw this same graph briefed to us by members of the International Energy Agency expert staff which delivered in no uncertain terms with no minced words, 
that we needed to be on course with our policies to completely eliminate energy-related carbon dioxide emissions by 2075 if we wanted even a 50-50 chance of limiting global temperature rise to 2 degrees C, which already was presenting health hazards that we considered in many parts to be untenable. We were briefed then. Many of us had been briefed even years before, but this was a good notice. The International Energy Agency also told us that if we cared about public health, that we would also then take note of the gap in investment that they saw between where we were going and where we needed to go. And I want to draw to your attention, because of the prior remarks, the link specifically to investment in better buildings, which is always our most cost-effective, most abundant, reliable, widely distributed and accessible clean energy resource, energy efficiency in our built environment. Now, the United States gathered its scientists to provide an assessment that was just coincident with the international assessment. But the US assessment is one I want to draw to the round table's attention because of the key findings on human health. This would be something to look at very closely in your work, I believe. And I want to draw some of the findings to your attention here by just quoting a couple of the key findings. One pointing out that certain people in communities are especially vulnerable. And the word certain is something that can be interrogated to find underlying determinants of inequality in American society that are addressed in every different facet that I know of in public health. Also, the responses to these concerns give us another way of looking at the lens between climate change and public health by noting that when we take action on climate and other types of uh, co-related pollutants, we often stand a good chance of improving and delivering other social benefits. Now, in the United States, the distribution of costs are not distributed equally related to specifically the largest disasters that we can observe related to extreme weather attributed to a changing climate. People in the southern states are on the front line of these damages, and they're already incurring huge, unrecovered and unrecoverable losses, wealth destruction, despite the emergency aid that we send. These costs are real and they accumulate all around the world, and they need to be factored into our choices about future investment. And so concurrent with the federal assessment that I just mentioned to you, the federal government during my period of service also instituted for the very first time a social cost on carbon to factor into the cost benefit analysis of every single rule that would affect carbon dioxide emissions. This was important to step to what would head up to that point been the major gap in public policy analysis, the assumption that carbon dioxide pollution had zero social costs. We knew the number wasn't zero. But when we started to interrogate the literature and the scientists provided evidence that allowed us to conclude that in these centering estimates, somewhere between 40 and $50 over the next 10 to 15 years is where we needed to be in terms of dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, estimating the social costs. This would have an important and profound effect on our ability to uh, analyze the policies for things like the clean power plant that you now see transforming and uh, affecting the electric power sector. When you think about the social cost of carbon as a public policy instrument, it's just a fiction in the actual economy until someone actually starts to pay it. It's a shadow price. <laughs> So now, in the second section, I want to actually talk about what it would mean to recover some portion of that social cost for public benefit and address interests in public health. Carbon pricing policy in the New England states is perhaps more advanced than other parts of the country. It is, in, in fact. And it has, over the last near decade, generated more than $1.5 billion in public receipts that have then been available for public spending. This is the results of the cap and trade program called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. But I want to draw to your attention the actual carbon prices being fetched here. Somewhere between oh, three and four dollars, ranging from say one to five. Friends, that is a 90% discount on the social cost of carbon. 
In other words, they were producing receipts that cumulatively over several years produced $1.5 billion, even after discounting the social cost of carbon by 90% when they collected this from the private sector. Are you following me? Some people are shaking their heads. Let me try that again. In the northeastern states, there is a climate policy that establishes through a cap-and-trade program a price on carbon that is designed to send a price signal to private sector actors that pollution is not free. In that system, they need to pay for the pollution to per permission to pollute by buying allowances that are available to them through an auction. And the auction fetches on the order of 3 to $4 per ton of carbon dioxide. My point here is that these prices are vastly lower than the actual social cost of carbon that the federal government assesses. But even at that level, it produces billion dollar scale benefits that are then associated with public spending programs that can be informed by the experts of public health. Now, have I said that more clearly? I apologize for my first attempt and thank you for the permission. What I want you to see is that in every single state then, there was a deliberative negotiation about how the money would be spent, and energy efficiency was at the top in every state, except for Maryland, actually, interestingly enough. And energy efficiency accounted for the lion's share of the benefits in this program for reasons that Michael has already discussed. However, public spending is not enough to overcome the barriers that we see in the clean energy revolution for two reasons. One relates to the scale of the demand, meaning our challenge is too big for public spending alone. It's going to require the, the vast majority of the money be sourced from the private sector. And also, even when you had all the private sector capital you could possibly want available, there remain barriers in place. And I want to discuss now those barriers. First of all, I want to point out that there are policies that affect the conditions for investment, public and private, across the United States. And the topography of those policies is important to analyze. We won't be able to do it here. But suffice it to say, they produce price signals that give you interesting indication of differing circumstances so that you can compare and contrast, say, Alabama and Mississippi to Colorado and California. And with this map, you can see why the difference between those two states would give you something of an enthusiasm gap for clean energy policies that might increase the cost of electricity to vulnerable communities in particular. The underlying conditions of this prior map, which is a strict average of electricity cost to household income, is the denominator. It's the household income indicator. It's essentially a shadow map of poverty in the United States. But this heat wave in the United States hasn't broken for 150 years. It must be reflected in many of the indicators that you study for public health around the country. And for that reason, I want to show you another graph that shows the persistence of poverty as it affects upper mobility. The chances that a child born in the bottom 25th percentile will ever leave it. This is not an equal opportunity map. My family is from North Carolina. And while I don't mean to be emotional, my point in showing these maps together is that my lineage of 10 generations in North Carolina cannot possibly explain the distance between my life outcome and the life outcomes in the dark purple area in the right side of North Carolina, predominantly African American persistent poverty part of our state. There are other factors at play than just plain luck. The NAACP has done an admirable job of highlighting the dimensions of equity that affect our clean energy future, and they've called for directed investment, policies that are intentionally running against the, the currents, meaning countercurrent, directing investment to areas where it's needed. But even where those investment policies are in place, which include North Carolina, we have seen barriers to investment persist. So North Carolina has a renewable energy po portfolio standard. It has an energy efficiency resource standard. It has net metering policies of sorts, things that have been called for in this report. But it hasn't been enough. So in my closing section, I want to introduce you to, in fact, a very interesting case of the only utility in the United States that is led by people of color and serving majority people of color community. That is the Roanoke Electric Cooperative here in Down East North Carolina. Now, electric cooperatives are a, a type of utility where the customers are their shareholders, so to speak. 
and they have an ownership stake in the utility and a right to vote that gives you an interesting convergence between governance and investment. Co-ops cover more than three quarters of the United States, serving more than 40 million people. Altogether, they buy $40 billion of electricity, and 90% of the persistent poverty counties in the United States are covered by electric cooperatives. The common qualifying criteria for loans and leases that apply all across the United States are things like, do you own your own home? Do you have a good credit score? Do you have sufficient income? And in Down East North Carolina at Roanoke Electric, when these three questions were asked of their members, so many of them were disqualified that practically zero were able to accept an extremely attractive offer of practically low interest loans with very, very attractive terms for lucrative investments in energy efficiency. One of the number one showstoppers was, do you own your own home? And I wanna underscore the point that Michael made earlier. More than half of everybody below median income is a renter. And if you start with a policy that requires you to go for loans and leases where you need to prove land ownership, landless poor people are out. And if you're concerned about public health and climate change, this is something that you have to overcome with innovative solutions. And the one I want to introduce you to is the inclusive financing solution called Pay As You Save. It's a utility financing solution that offers all customers the option to access cost-effective energy upgrades using a proven investment and cost recovery model that benefits both the customer and the utility this way. The utility is able to draw low-cost capital from the same sources that it always does for every one of its infrastructure investments and to pay for all cost-effective distributed energy solutions that then can be tied to the meters they serve for which costs can be recovered on the bill with a charge that is less than the estimated savings because these are cost-effective investments. In this way, the customer is then participating in the cost recovery without being personally assigned a debt obligation and for that reason no longer suffers the scrutiny that a financial sector requires that systematically and structurally disqualifies them from the clean energy economy as if we are redlining our clean energy future. The pay as you save solution essentially allows us to look at the clean energy future in a more inclusive way with no consumer loan, lien, or debt. It reaches market segments that are chronically locked out. And as a result, it's not just clean energy for those market segments, it produces better benefits for everyone, higher participation rates and deeper savings. To quickly close on this type of point related to results, what you'll see here is that compared to loan-based or debt-based instruments, inclusive financing allows you to imagine a larger addressable market. People say yes to the financing offer at a much higher rate because the terms are less risky and therefore more attractive. And because they're more attractive, they say yes to bigger projects that produce deeper savings. And these are multiplying factors two times the customer eligibility, times five times the customer acceptance rate, times double the deal size, that's getting you an order of magnitude or more increase in your investment uh, deployment. I'll tell you now what happened after Roanoke Electric was able to demonstrate success in that persistent poverty region of Down East North Carolina, so did another cooperative in Southern Arkansas and their results this year have been incredibly impressive, comparing the first three months of their inclusive financing program to the best three months of their debt-based program. They validated the theory I just introduced to you. They showed that within less than four months, they were able to double the number of customers, serve renters for the very first time. Every single renter in multifamily housing opted in when given the opportunity, and the, the size of the investment was double what it previously had been, in fact, double the scale that Michael had discussed earlier for simple weatherization projects. As a result, they quadrupled the investment deployment in a community that experiences persistent poverty. Now you can see across this map how the idea is spreading. I bring it to your attention because I think public health officials across the United States need to be familiar and be able to gain some fluency in opportunities that should be available to every American. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to your cross-examination.